Okay, so this next one is Tinchabri, which we have covered already in a different system, the House of Normandy, which was uh, a Holland Spiel game. It's over there. That little uh, dark spot between empires and Almoravid. Uh, what do we got here? So this is... Uh, what, Robert of Normandy versus King Henry the First? Yeah, Henry the First. Um, relieving, uh, a, Robert is relieving a siege. Uh, you know, there were basically three kings who were fighting over the Norman inheritance. And uh, Henry <laughs> was the one without a real title, right? Uh, William Rufus got uh, uh, the crown of England, and uh, uh, Robert of Normandy, well, got Normandy, which were both important holdings. Um, Henry got some territories, I think, under Robert, uh, under, uh, you know, w within Robert's duchy. Uh, but he kind of played both sides and eventually ended up with both. Uh, bonus! <laughs> um, so what do we have here? Uh, largely a pikeman across the front here. There's an archer in each line and then a mounted man-at-arms. And then the king has a, mounted, a pair of dismounted men-at-arms uh, with his force. That's Henry's side of things. Robert has pikes with archers kind of intermingled. I put them on the flanks where I can, but I got to put one in here. Um, the, the English archers are, they're counted as English. I, I don't know, is William dead by now? Mm. So William the first is dead, yeah, no doubt. This is 1105. I think Rufus is dead by this point. I don't know. But this is the battle in which he captured Robert uh, and imprisons him afterwards. Anyway, um, Robert's got uh, men at arms behind each of these. These are mounted, and then one dismounted here. In addition, there's some Britons who are awaiting in reserve, that have gone on a flanking maneuver. Obviously, Henry vastly outnumbers uh, Robert's forces. Not only does he slightly outnumber him as on here, but he also has the Britons who are coming around the flank, which isn't huge. It's three, um, three mounted men. Mountain men. Um, and the way they work is you roll a die, to bring them in, you have to roll a 10 or higher. Uh, you roll a die on each uh, free activation that Henry gets, and it gets a plus one each time he fails. Since you can't roll a 10 on the first die, he's not going to show up um, until at least the second free activation that Henry gets. The Normans are going to go first. They're timed with 15 turns here. Here's where uh, the points are, and we're going to count down because there's no special having die rolls or anything like that. No terrain. Apparently there was a hill uh, that they can't really, you know, determine whether it was on the battlefield or not. So they put it off the battlefield, which works well. I don't know what these little symbols are. <laughs> Is that where the Britons come through? It doesn't look like it. Uh, 0822, 0922. Oh, 0809, yeah, yeah. This is where the Britons might come in when they do so. Um, no shield walls, nothing like that. Nothing fancy. But, while we don't have the kind of horses that uh, William the Conqueror had, we do have some horsemen here. Otherwise, this is pretty much, you know... And we have some dismounted infantry. This is pretty much your standard again. I'm expecting the attacker to get the advantage, especially without a shield wall in place. 
Who's the attacker? Well, the aggressor is supposed to be the Normans. So <laughs> we'll see. Uh, they get the first. They get the first shot, and that's tended to be a pretty big deal. Um, in previous, however, in terms of leadership, three plus ones. You know, it's kind of funny. I noticed, uh, and, and yeah, the leadership looks approximately equivalent. No, no big bonus for Henry there. Um, it's kind of funny. I noticed something here, which was when you're charging. Let's see. So attacking units stacked with a leader use charisma rating. But elsewhere... Where is it? I swear I saw one. I swear I saw something. Stacking men at arms. Mounted men at arms stacked with a leader when charging gives an additional plus one on top of the charisma, which is kind of weird. I don't know. <laughs> it, it just like, it's not what I expected. It feels almost like charisma was something that was added to the system. I think that's an old modifier that used to be there, and then the charisma modifier has been added in on top of that. And I'm not sure if that's. Uh, if they're both supposed to be in play, but whatever, <laughs> it makes no difference. It's, you know, risking your leader is, is pretty cool. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see too much here, uh, uh, that I find terribly exciting. The only question is, do we continue to see the same advantage? Uh, the pikemen are not that impressive. They're all plus one defenses except, oh no, that's an archer. Uh, the archers, well... The English archers are a little worse than the Norman ones. And the horsemen are okay. Like, nothing fantastic. I'm not expecting anything uh, tremendous out of any of these forces. I mean, it should come down to a luck fest, to a large extent, with a slight advantage going to the English, but I, I you know... I would give the advantage to whoever gets the most luck, but then also they have a larger force, so they have a higher flight level as well. So um, in terms of forces, they feel pretty evenly matched, but we will see if there's a big advantage for the attacker. By the way, as to my personal stuff, um, yeah, I had my, my initial sort of phone interview, and I just basically made it damn clear. I'm, I... I don't want to work. <laughs> I really don't want to work. Um, you know, it, it, it just, I feel better already. <laughs> so much better having made that decision. There's no real absolute need for me to do so. I, I can't imagine that I'm going to live long enough that it's going to be an issue. It's just, I don't know, you know, with, uh, with the amount of time I've been spending playing Raid and everything, I'm like, well, this isn't how I wanted to spend my retirement years, and it really isn't. And that's the thing I've got to get through my stupid little head, is um, figure out a way to break away from that. Um, I feel like I'm doing a little bit this week. I may start doing more and more. Uh, I don't think work working is the answer for that. I kind of have it, among other things, I have this fear that like, oh yeah, I would be playing Raid and trying to do my work at the same time or something like that, which is just, that's bullshit, right? <laughs> like there's no way, I, sure. <laughs> you know, I'd make more money that way, but uh, it, it, that just is not, not acceptable. And um, yeah, you know, I don't mind playing some of it, I just, I can't let it rule my fucking life any longer. Um, and I don't want work to rule my life either. There's, you know, I may have been happier a couple of years back before I was playing Raid while I was working, but I blame that all on one thing in, in, as the primary factor. Now, but still, you know, I mean, when I'm not playing, down there, I'm watching videos. If I, even though I'm staying away from raid, 
to some extent. I'm just, I'm still doing the same kind of shit at home that I do all the time, but I am much happier the further the distance from uh, that video game that I am. And I'm not starting right away because I gotta go play Raid. <laughs> but I'm already like, you know, an hour later than I normally would and whatnot. And just, you know, I am, I am breaking away. <laughs> How much can I, I don't know. So I'd probably wanna hit with the best quality I can. I'm looking through the line. Ugh. I need Robert uh, to be aligned with someone. I, I need to reset up uh, these units. The commanders, actually I can't move anyone. The commanders are all in fixed locations in this one. Uh, there might be one exception. This guy might be able to be in either of these hexes, I think. Um, but anyway, yeah, the commanders are in fixed locations, which means I can't do anything to guarantee um, my, uh, or, or to help improve my chances of getting a continuation. I also have to grab the seizure markers. It's like uh, probably 11 a.m. on Tuesday. Huh. It means I gotta pull the garbage down. And I don't remember if it's like recycling day or yard stuff day. I, they used to give me a little calendar thing that I could put on the fridge. Really cheap little nice, nice aspect. And I can look online, but there's no reason for that. The recycling can is so huge. <coughs> oh boy. I make decisions, I pulled the, uh, the chits. We got two seizures here, into the breaches, and battle cry. And again, I can't remember which one's which. Into the breaches is the, the, the offensive one because it sounds more defensive. And yes, yes, I know Henry V and <laughs> Shakespeare said it on an attack, but that's not enough. That's just not enough. And, and battle cry, to me, I don't know. To me, into the breach, it sounds defensive. And that's just how, how it feels to me. And, and really, these need to be more descriptive. Uh, I, I wouldn't be shocked if that's a Bergism, though. He, that's the kind of thing he liked to do. And here we have unsteady troops, which can be really useful on attack. I have to remember that battle cry, which is, again, the rallying, not the offensive one. So-so. <sighs> you can do a standard activation for it. It could be useful if something big gets hit. And one seizure opportunity. Ugh. Um... The forces are all very similar. I want to hit a flank. Um, everything's pretty much the same. So there's no real reason to favor one or the other, except that I know the Britons are off here, which I probably shouldn't even know. Um, I think I'm going to launch over here. Blanc. And that's not right. Is that Moraine? <laughs> There we go. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and try to see what I can do. I may try to move the leader into a position where he is closer that, you know, I can set up so that on his neck, on his continuation roll, he'll be able to get the bonus. Kind of went to hell because I want to charge and hit those archers. Uh, but honestly, I think I want to shift things like this instead. I'm using the charge no move marker again to remind me that it's a charge that I did move in. Because there is nothing that helps you record that. And I'm forgetting about counter charges. I don't know that I've been in a situation where one could have happened, the Normans could have done one, perhaps. Um, in, in Hastings, but I didn't really need to. All right, and uh, we got a disorder here, and we're all hitting, coming down the line like that. Wait, and I keep stopping and starting because I don't want to just video through the entire thing with all the die rolls and everything like I did for the first couple of battles, especially as these battles are getting bigger. But um, <coughs> there's a certain sameness to these suckers, 
And I gotta say, GBOH has that same issue, right? Uh, there, there was always an attempt, like on the earliest GBOH games, like the, the original Alexander, especially, you can think of it that way, but also um, in a fair amount. Chariot did it as well. Uh, the Musket and Pike games, the original Men of Iron, there was an attempt to create, hey, let's give you four different types of battles, you know, in these four different things. Now, so far there's been a, 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 a kind of depressing feeling of sameness throughout this one, which kind of leads it to the, yeah, okay, but how many medieval, and, and this is why, you know, you didn't see a whole shit ton of medieval battles come out. How, how many of these medieval set piece kind of battles can you really watch? You know, they're just not that different. And for me, back when I was like, you know, 12, 13, that was what I was into and wanted to see. But I think even then, I would have gotten kind of depressed by the just one after the other of the same kind of stuff showing up. Now, with the Ancients, one of the advantages you have is some very, very different weapon system facing each other. But when you're looking at battles the Normans fought in over a period of time, yeah, they're fairly limited in terms of uh, what we've got. We've got enough time period here, at least, though, over, uh, you know, 200 years or whatever, where I think we're going to start seeing more horsies in it. I'm not sure. Probably not too many. There's still going to be a, a, fair, a, fair, a fairly heavy proportion of regular good old infantry in it. Uh, do I want to play something I don't have? Do I want to play an unsteady troops to help breach the line? I could get lucky, you know? Why do it now? I don't know. <laughs> In this situation, there is an advantage to the initial attack. Um, that's not been the case in all the battles, though. But every single pike unit in this scenario has a plus one on its defense, which is bad, right? You want a zero. In some of the other scenarios, there were zeros. There I don't think there were any minus one pike units or whatever, which means that the pikes were relatively easy. The, at worst, you are facing an even odds type of fight. The fact that these other units aren't very solid either is okay, because they're charging. They're not going to break formation or anything. Um, unlike the attack when you get to the gunpowder era, uh, the attack here is a mass of pikemen moving forward. Unless the attack gets disrupted itself. The cab did not succeed in, uh, in in making its charge. It failed. These guys had a continuing attack, which I presumably could have had an effect, but it didn't. We have a number of engaged units, but for the most part, all of, including the engaged units, all of the defending units were disordered. That's a big deal. Now when they attack back, they're at a penalty. Um, so, yeah, and that puts it on the English who have the option, oh, I'm sorry, it, it puts it here. I'm going to uh, try to trigger Robert here and bring another force into play. Um, but the English could try to seize this and try to force, maybe get a first strike over here. Um, but. No matter what I do, this is weakened, right? This flank could collapse, and it's very likely that one flank on e that each side will win a flank in this kind of situation. Do I want to let him make his roll? Yeah, that first attack might be important. Um, coming to that decision, I'm going to fire off a zero to five seizure on him. Now, no matter what, this results in either. I get it, and I'll fire off this flank, I guess. I don't know. Could just do this other. Mm. Or I'll, uh, I'll get a free activation over on the Norman side. 
and free activation it is. We're not going to stop right there. Um, ignore this, we ignore that. It's only on English free activations that this happens. One reason I might not want to be seizing things. And we're back here, and I can use either of my forces now. Um, pushing these guys up has some advantage in terms of trying to get the commanders closer together, but maybe even more important is protecting the flank of these units because these could hit there if I don't. Not limited, I could pursue uh, these guys some more and try to win that battle, and I actually think that's better. I have a fair amount of forces in pretty good shape. And these horses, they could actually hit both of these conceivably. I mean, the pike have to hit the horse, but that's, uh, that's not... Actually, yeah, but they could do it supported by these. Oh, there's a retreat before combat there. Option, or a charge option, counter charge, maybe. I'm allowed to rotate on a counter charge. Eh. Yeah, deal, dealing with this might not be might not be as easy as I, I hope. So, and, and this is where it starts getting different, is now with some cav in the mix, I'm actually able to maybe turn the tide in an area where I wouldn't have been able to fight effectively before. But is there any kind of pinning? Uh, the unit cannot count charge or counter charge if it began the activation adjacent to an enemy unit, but only for charges. Oh, that doesn't help. If it began the activation adjacent to an enemy unit and is still uh, adjacent to the enemy unit when the counter charge is uh, affected. Yeah, so I would be able to do a boop boop. So I think I'm going to activate this and see if I can destroy that flank. There is the situation. We have retired quite a few. You can see the English points are going way down. Um, 14, yeah, I'm not in the die roll territory yet, but getting close. Tie down these uh, uh, horsemen. Engaged here as well. Here we got to push back. Uh, we pretty much got all the disordered units except this one, one way or another. And. I get to go with another activation. I don't know which side to take. Um, the idea of flanking in here is less attractive now. Like, I, I can't really protect that flank, can I? Well, one, two, three, four archers coming in the flank. That doesn't really help, but they can be close, which is kind of helpful. I don't know. I don't know. I think I'll try these. I don't think the English want to waste their second seizure on this because that could just give this another activation and finish off that whole, whole wing. I call them wings. Uh, that's not going to work. That's going to be a free activation. We'll flip this over and that means it's Brittany arrival die roll. He needs a 10 or higher. He has no modifiers. It's not going to happen. So we push that there. And what do I do with my free activation? Damned if I know. <clears throat> what do I have? I have a battle cry. I could rally something. I think I'm going to rally these forces as a whole. That gives me three of these back. Making things look a lot better. And then... See, it's really hard, like... If this were a Civil War style game or whatever, I would be turning and, and hitting units here, but it's really hard to do that. It's like, yeah, but then I expose. But I could shift over, hit those guys in the flank, do some damage to them, and I think that's not a terrible choice. So I'm gonna go for this. Now he could go for a siege opportunity, a seizure opportunity. Doesn't really want to. It just, you know, the one, the zero through three is about the same kind of chance. 
<laughs> kind of, sort of. And yeah, we're back to uh, free activation over here. Um, okay. <laughs> we might just keep plowing with that one unit. Uh, I'll think. So we did. So there was a successful charge through the standard here, which destroyed a unit. We destroyed a couple of units here. And this is back down to 12, as this is just disintegrating. And now I get to act, and I really don't know. Uh, the English are in a lot of trouble. <coughs> um, I think I'm going to attempt to seize the opportunity here. That's a zero through six. I'm going to try to do it with these guys. I want to get them into play, smash that up, but yeah, it doesn't look good no matter how I play it. Okay, we get it. We're shifting over over here. Uh, I don't know quite where my shocks are going to go. I want to bump that one more than this one. That he couldn't get around then, you know, hit it from multiple different angles. I've got a charge going here. That's going to push up to here, but there's going to be a possible counter charge against that. So how do we counter charge? Counter charge against charge. Um, both die before the enemy charge attack is resolved. Okay. We've got a counter charge versus cavalry somewhere. There we go. Add the counter charging units shock DRM. Now I'm allowed to shift one if I succeed. I got no DRM there. I got a leader. The counter charging unit has to change facing, so that's a stupid plus one on there. Um, so I need a three or less, which I get. That means I blunt the charge, and we just have a normal shock between those two at this point. I'll put it like this, which might be good enough. Um, I have not moved my archers yet, and I haven't used this pike. Yeah. Not really sure. I think I can move uh, one hex. I think I can move one hex as long as, e even though I started in a in a, a zone. So these guys could actually. Oh no, these guys aren't part of this battle. That's why they can't do anything. Um. These archers can get themselves into play to shoot someone. I don't know what I want to shoot. So shooting the horsies is at a penalty. Shooting the pikemen would not be, but no matter what, I think it's going to be raining fire. So we'll go to there and shoot those. Oh, uh, it's not very likely. I can do this. Those aren't engaged. They're shocking. Yeah, well, that's not going to do anything. I'm going to swap batteries and resolve the combats. One thing to note is that the English Cav, at least some of it, is better. Those are dismounted. Um, it is better than the Norman Cav. Uh, so I actually had a slight advantage hitting here anyway, even with the charge. Uh, you can see, I was able to push those units out of the way. Now the question is, do I want to, yeah, I don't, I don't know which, which unit I'm going to pick, right? But do the Normans want to do a, a seizure here? Because... This is kind of exposed, slamming into that would open things up quite a bit. That looks very attractive. So I think no matter who the English pick, that's not a bad idea. Um, the English could pick the king here. He doesn't have a lot of troops under his command, but they could be really key at this moment. So we're gonna fire off that seizure. Now, 
Technically, we have to wait until he makes his decision, but, you know. <laughs> I, I would rather, uh, that's not going to happen. That means we're going to have a, a free activation here. And that means it's Brittany's chance to shine once again. I want to break, though, just because I like to take little breaks. Uh, <laughs> and why not? I'm feeling this enormous weight off my shoulders. Like, I don't know if I just feel as good as I did before I started getting, before I noticed an email that was like, hey, we got a place for you if you want it. <laughs> or if I've just made up that ground or if I actually feel better is, is basically the, the two questions. Um, I know I'm less upset about playing right now for some reason. I'm having real trouble focusing. I like the kind of, I don't know, lethargic. I, I'm still lethargic, uh, but just sitting in front of the screen watching a video, that's harder to do right now. I'm not sure why. Uh, I'm okay when I'm playing Raid. That gives me something to do fiddling. I was okay doing this kind of thing, uh, I don't know, not that long ago, like within the last couple of days. But right now, I watch like 10 minutes of a video and I'm like a 20 minute video and I'm like, I just can't. <laughs> so I'm back up here and let's roll for the Brittany because we got a chance. Oh, how about that? That's going to save England's ass, isn't it? And we've successfully had a reinforcement roll. Then I can get rid of this. Um, I had to look up the rolls. And they show up off map adjacent to all those spaces. Their first movement point sends them into a space. Uh, every reinforcement goes to full movement point. I'm looking for the uh, flag. That's the thing. I don't know when the flag comes in. Oh, here we go. If a reinforcing battle has a standard, it should be placed during the activation. The first uh, units enter the map. I don't know if I really need to bring them on right now. It doesn't. Like, I thought it, it's going to save their ass, but it doesn't really. <laughs> it gives me more forces on this side of the battle that I don't really um, need them in. But this is a free activation which means I can use this force again and continue my attack on uh, the Norman right. The result of that is to clear up a bunch of this. I, you know how this feels? It reminds me of the, a little bit of the swirling actions in the Musket and Pike Cav only battles, or where Cav were fighting Cav. Uh, which would make sense if I had Cav fighting Cav, but I've got like spearmen marching off to each other. It, the, the system's just a little too fluid, right? <laughs> I'm able to slip units in behind, you know, between things and everything. Yeah, you can't go direct, so you can't go, they got rid of the term zone of control for this, but you can't go from adjacent to a unit to still adjacent to that unit uh, in movement. And when you move adjacent to a unit, you stop moving. So there is a fair amount of um, preventing movement. The other thing that it kind of reminds me of is, since I was playing uh, Gettysburg recently with something else, in Terrible Swift Sword, when I totally misunderstood the rules for that, uh, we had units swinging around doing some really crazy stuff in, in the same sort of uh, very fluid sort of fashion. The combat system is just too, uh, or the movement system is just very fluid given these formations that are kind of standing here. I, you would probably see something like it in GBOH as well uh, sometimes. But again, it tends to be more with the CAV units that have enough movement allowance to take advantage of that. Mm, these guys have a reasonable amount though, so I don't know. Uh, but anyway, we busted through there. Uh, no more, continue, no more uh, seizures, which means I can just go to a continuation. And this is the big question. I think I want to try to launch this attack. Um, I want to, while trying to extricate whoever the hell this is back here, 
Surrey. William of Surrey. Uh, while I'm try you know, while I could try to extricate him, chances are he'll just get hit again, and that isn't necessarily very good. I'm better off um, trying to force the battle to be successful somewhere else. So we'll run over here. I'm not going to move the Britons, although, wow, they could do a lot. Yeah, let's go for the Britons. What the hell? They're on the board, man. Yeah, they're not happening. Which means a free activation over here. And now it's time. Yeah, here, here's the problem. If I advance with these, they become even more vulnerable to the Britons. Um, I think my best move is to throw uh, Robert in and try to try to take advantage of the bad positioning that this force is in. Okay, that smashed in pretty hard. We ended up uh, with a charge hitting the ass of some pikemen and also advanced in here. Eh, I think we just killed, uh, I don't think we killed anything, but we uh, damaged the unit. And again, the British, British points are getting down, uh, down to where we have to start checking soon. Um, no more seizures. I still didn't do any of these. Unsteady troops would be useful. Battle cry would be useful to bringing him back. Might be worth doing. Um, but the, with no seizures, I get to try to activate someone else. And here, well, I don't have a lot of choices. I can do this, but I feel like that's setting me up for disaster. I can go over here. Now, I got Robert of Normandy, um, my commander here. Where's this guy? William. Yeah, he's not going to have a bonus there. Uh, so we're at a three. And we get it. Which means I do stuff with him. Um, I think I'll battle cry to remove this. That gets me a point back. And then I'll try to extricate myself from this situation. The situation's pretty good for him. Um, I think we'll walk up and shoot these retired units. And not that they're doing much, but they do have a zone of influence or whatever you want to call it. Which means I would have to go way down to do anything else. Yeah, let's just move up there and shoot them. Um, that'll be a plus one. Plus two, plus three. I don't think retired has an effect. Six. That's a retired on a retired. Ooh, what that does. Again, it's a wall of text where it's really hard to find. Like, I can't remember where that sentence might be within that wall. So I have to read the entire paragraph again. I think he probably just retires back to his standard, which is not optimal. But I was hoping for an eliminated. I'll have to check that. Any retreat, retire, or eliminated result causes the unit to be eliminated. Again, if this was in single line, all, all segmented out, I would probably have a pretty good guess where to find it and find it almost immediately. Somehow, the lack of structure of the numeric, uh, of getting rid of the numerical thing, this could be buried anywhere in here and it just feels different. Like, I'm pretty sure this would be at the end in a, in a numbered system. It's not guaranteed. But it's also much, much easier to glance and you could see things like retire or uh, retreat or something like that um, when it's not packed together in a paragraph form. It's just much, much harder to search. <laughs> Perfectly easy when you've got everything on electronic, you know, devices, you could probably do it just fine. Anyway, that's going to kill this which is cool, and it's not a melee, so uh, that was already a retired unit. I don't know if I paid the point for it, but the English are having enough trouble. Kind of cheated a little in timing. I'm playing the unsteady here. I should have done it before I did anything, but 
I'm just revealing that, oh yeah, that unit's actually still not disordered, and I could get a lot of points off of killing this. And then, if it's a free activation, well, already uh, the Brits are failing on an 8 or 9, and things are getting worse where we plowed into there. They still have this battle to do, too. And so we were able to kill one of the mounted men-at-arms, retire another one. That one's only worth one. Kill, who is it here? Richard of Montfort, who's in charge of this yellow force. William of Surrey managed to escape, but he's only got one unit left. <laughs> uh -oh. And things look really bad for the English. They're down to a two here, which means, you know, if I get a free activation, I trigger these two, and that gives me a chance <laughs> to survive. <laughs> but not much of one. Oh, and this rallies. I had to check to see whether or not you could rally uh, a unit that wasn't in command. You can. That's cool. Makes sense. And I just did the greens. I can try to do Robert again here. He's a three down, one is a two. There's not much he can do about it. I'm out of chits over on the Norman side. Okay, so that gives the free activation here. We'll fire these two off, getting myself two more points back. And let's see if the game's over, man. Four or higher, it's done. Nope. Uh, but now the Brits get a continuation, and that's tricky. So, I get Richard back. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I think he's what I need to activate. Yeah. And the king is still back here. La, 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 la. I only have two dismounted men at arms. I can't do much, so I'll never do anything. <laughs> uh, into the breach. Not a rally. Um, it's a... That's the combat bonus one. I went in this called plus one combo, plus one attack or something like that. Yeah. I, again, <laughs> it's it's one thing to have a name on a CDG card, and that not relate to what it does because the card can explain what it does. When you're dealing with chits, and I found this really annoying with some of the the old SPI games that used event chits as well. They just tell you one, you know, they have a word or two on them. Very, very easily they could just tell you, like here, it could say plus one uh, shock charge. <laughs> you know, that could be the title of it instead of into the breach. Could just tell you what it does. Seizure? I think I think Berg kept that because he liked the pun too much instead of giving it some stupid name. Battle cry. What's battle cry? Well, it's a rally chip. It really is. So it could say uh, rally or something like that. Of course, there's an order for rallies or a rule for rallies, but still, you know. And what, what, what is the other one? Unsteady troops. Eh, that's not too bad. But it's basically disorder an enemy. <laughs> you know, I, 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 using some kind of more f florid language doesn't really help. And uh, there, there, there were games that had a, had a lot of this. It's kind of like the translation of like if you're given an icon for something, trying to figure out what it means. It just it's an annoying thing, right? Um, if you're absolutely addicted to it, like I was, you know, say with magic. Yeah, I'm familiar with all the symbols, or I was familiar with all the symbols, and I'm still familiar with all the symbols of that time, but there are a whole shitload more, as I found out from some other cards I got. And I don't know why I got them. I had hopes that my wife would enjoy magic, but she, she didn't get into the whole deck building side of it. She got into, um, I don't know what they're called. Uh... 
not the collectible games, the, uh, I used to know the, the name for these. Uh, <laughs> uh, and now I can't even remember the game. We played a lot of it. I think it started with a D. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, where, where, where you have a tableau of cards available to you and you purchase them. And I can't even remember. I know it's not LCGs, which was something that, like, I don't know what the hell that is. <laughs> I never knew what that was. Um, oh, deck builders. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, she, got, she got into uh, certainly the one, the one deck builder, and I can't remember the name of it anymore. Um, it's the big one. And we played some others, which she kind of liked. As opposed to like, hey, here's your pile of cards. Figure out a deck you want to build out of that. You know, <laughs> which is just weird. And yeah, there, you know, I figure those of you who are still along for the ride at this point, you're here for the ride more than <laughs> anything else. Where the hell am I? I am on not a free activation, but a reactivation. And I think it's going to be him. So I, I think it's got to be him. So we'll make a roll for him. See if we get a free activation on the Norman side. And we do not. So now I have to start thinking how I want to deal with him. Problems with the game. Um, disengagement's difficult. It should be, right? That's not really a problem. But <laughs> there's no concept of falling back and trying to create a defensive uh, position or anything like that. There is no advantage to the defender. Um, and especially in this scenario, look, you got to just keep pushing forward. You, you can't, you know, and if you think about it, these, they're Mark Pike, but they're basically spearmen, right? <sighs> these are not units that I expect to just constantly be operating, you know, like a hoplite army or something like that, which is kind of how they feel as opposed to falling back and present, presenting the, um, a line of spears that the enemy doesn't really want to approach. Now, it's a fair point, though, to say we're not entirely sure about how medieval warfare was accomplished in a lot of ways. The descriptions of ancient warfare tend to be better than what we have for most medieval accounts. And so... Is there, some, is there a core assumption here that I'm just kind of rebelling against that's in that gray area of we don't know enough about medieval warfare to be able to say, did the attacker just have this kind of advantage? It doesn't feel like it when you talk about something like Hastings. It feels like the thing that screwed uh, the Saxon army up was that it, they came out of their defensive position and fought back and attacked and charged down uh, and broke formation. But I've got a lot less certainty when I'm talking about 1106, whether or not a bunch of, you know, levy spearmen or whatever these are, um, are going to be particularly st sturdy on the defense. Whereas, yeah, maybe they can do some damage if they attack. And, and so, you know, that, that would be based on um, somebody is making a decision here. And it's largely based on the factors, you know, the defensive factors on the units. That these spearmen could not sustain an attack by their own kind. Uh, an attack by their own kind would generally push them back, hurt them. Whatever. Anyway, given that situation, and that's not you know necessarily the same situation that we saw at Hastings, but still, uh, the troops weren't good enough to really be a sturdy defense. Um, but anyway, here here we're going to launch these attacks, and yeah, I mean it's to my best advantage to hit things 
even if they're not disordered or whatever. This should be here. It's kind of a mixed bag. Um, we recover these. <laughs> At least there's that. Uh, but, and you know, it's funny, again, here, this doesn't have any kind of clever flowery language on it. No move, no fire. I would much rather see in bold letters rally and maybe in parentheses, no move, no fire. In smaller text, you know. Um, but, yeah. yeah. Just been through those choices. Like, there's just, I could see giving both pieces of information. If you were only going to give one, give the important one. Why am I using this counter? <laughs> Not what does it do, what's its effect. Why am I using it? Um, okay. I'm not using it to not move and not fire. I'm using it to rally. Both things are in effect, but one of them is the primary, right? Okay, anyway, we launched our attack here. What do we go for now? Just, do we want to throw the king in? Because our only other option is really this poor sucker. Now, getting him out of the way, yeah, we could launch an attack here, widen the battlefield. Um, might be worth it. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, getting this guy out of the way might be useful, but I'm just kind of hoping he doesn't lose me the game, I think. A whole bunch of attacks across here. All right, let's go here. That's a two. And that does not work. That gets us to a free activation here. Um, I've babbled long enough. I haven't gotten a lot of playing in. But part of it was I was hoping that the game would break there. <laughs> because it's, it's obvious the British are gonna, the, the English are gonna lose, right? It's just obvious at this point. But, especially if they keep not using their fucking chits. I'm really bad with chits or hold cards or anything like that in any any game, um, unless it's like the whole mechanism. And even there, so like reaction cards, when you use them in you know a CDG or something, yeah, I can't remember that shit. And it kind of doesn't matter whether I'm playing solo or opposed. I'm just bad at it. I don't remember these things. Cards are a little easier to cope with than chits. Um, but yeah. It feels, uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm not gonna suggest, oh, there should be cards for these tiny six, seven card decks or whatever that there would be. I don't suggest that at all. I just, I, I, I don't like the mechanisms where I have to remember what I've got. That's not sort of, you know, all my focus is on the field, the battle. It's not on this hand of cards or chits or whatever that I've got. You know, that this is not even something that comes into mind. What are these? You know, these are like incantations that, that my general has or something. And sure, they're not like weather or whatever, but they're just kind of like, oh, I think the enemy will be disordered now. <laughs> Um, the seizure mechanism, I liked the way it worked better in the original. I don't like this, this whole clunky chit system at all. Um, give me a plus one. Come on, the dice are random enough. Let the dice live their own, you know? <laughs> and then, um, what else do we have? The, the bonus rally, which to me is kind of cheap. Like, one of the, one of the cool decisions of this was... You got some troops that are starting to, to form up that are disorganized and whatever. Should I pay attention to them and do something about them? The only thing that I don't like about it is it doesn't use up their battles commander in any way. Like, in Great Battles of History, if you want to rally units, you have to kind of use the leaders to do it. Here, yeah, there's just this magic flag back there that, you know... It doesn't, it doesn't make sense because the troops that are up front, why aren't they still fighting? Why can't they, right? And the guys who are in the back, why can't they rally if the leader's not involved in it, right? And that's kind of the whole thing. Like, I get it if the leader has to go back and rally the troops and not give orders. I get it that the leader's giving orders and can't go back and rally the troops. But it all just seems to be, no, 
the flag has decided to rally the troops. It really does feel that way. And again, a little goofy. Um, that's one of the few things from the original uh, part of this series that I did not, that, you know, never really felt right. There were a couple of others. Some of the timing issues feel a little too overblown. These guys are just sitting there across from each other. Yeah, sometimes that happened. But the game tends to promote that. If there are more than two battles in, on the field at the same time, the fighting happens in one place or in two places. It does not happen across the field. And there were quite often battles where the entire battlefield is engaged. This system doesn't handle that. It does a really good job of um, showing those battles where part of the battle, part of part of the battlefield was just unused. But I think those are rare overall. <laughs> it really focuses you in on hey, whoever landed that first blow, things have to be done. You have to withdraw um, and form up defenses. Although in this one. The fact that things are more active on the offense or more effective on the offense actually means that maybe you don't see this kind of concentration as much, although we're definitely seeing it here. Take that free activation and launch attacks. Uh, coming back here with what's his name? Marain. I don't know, Martin. I'm not sure. My eyes aren't that good. <laughs> These glasses aren't that good. My eyes are just terrible, but it, I do have glasses that uh, fix them. And we'll handle a lot of flanking attacks, etc. Our goal is to just get this number down as low as possible so that the English surrender after their next act, uh, free activation. Uh, we didn't get any bonus kills. Uh, well, we killed one pike, which drops that down to one. Surrey is gone. Um, he didn't get killed, but he has no more units on the map, so we can just withdraw him. He's no longer a source of points. I'll get his flag out of there, because it doesn't do anything anymore. Uh, but otherwise, you can see the Norman line has gotten a little bit more um, believable. <laughs> Got a unit marching its way around about in here. This flag, it might make sense to move it, but it might not. It's not really doing any harm where it is. And that requires a flag activation. That means I go to my second uh, attempt to activate, and I think I go back here. We have everything in command because they're all adjacent. So that's grady great. And now we just need a three. And we don't get it. That puts a free activation over here. Um, I mean, the English could just surrender at this point. Like, they have no chance, but their best chance would be to rally this unit, getting a point back. It also speeds the decision-making up. Like, I could launch a whole attack, cause maybe some damage to the Normans, not enough that they'd have to ever roll a die roll, um, and then have a greater chance of failure. So let's see... All right, that's the end of it. So there is Tinchabrai. Once again, the attacker wins. Um, in this case, the attacker had a notably weaker force. Okay, but it was approximately equal in the units that mattered, which was the, that mass of, uh, of spearmen going forward. They were about e equivalent and bad spearmen are good at attacking other bad spearmen <laughs> is what it comes down to. Um, so yeah, that that pretty much uh, was the determinant. Once again, who got the jump to be able to attack? And then, you know, did they get to bring more forces into play? <sighs> Same old game, once again. We don't have a lot left. I think we have Luz, Lewis and Evesham. And that's it. And these are both uh, from the Baron's War era, a little later on. We'll see if they change things. The original Men of Iron was set in a period where you were looking at cavalry armies 
a mounted men at arms, etc., trying to defeat infantry on defense. And the infantry on defense held the ground. Infidel, the Crusader battles, you have very, very different weapon systems facing each other. Uh, so, I don't know. You know? <laughs> um, Arquebus, I think they were relatively similar forces as they were in Blood and Roses, but they were different in both cases from anything we had seen before. I think Arquebus actually defense was fairly strong. And, and remember, there you have some firepower and whatnot. Uh, Blood and Roses, again, I also think the defense was not, uh, was not so weak as it is here. This is the first in the series that I, I feel like the attacker has just got this incredible advantage. And it's an advantage that I don't think the battles actually um, support. <laughs> Uh, it may make sense in certain of the battles, but I feel like the system is just not working as it should in many cases. Did I fuck up here? Maybe I did something, you know, that was unclever with the English. But it, the way they're set up, it's really hard to bring their, their, uh, their mounted troops into play before the battle was already basically decided by a couple of Norman activity. Uh, the Norman leaders aren't particularly good. They might get unlucky, whatever. But yeah, I even got my Britons, but they didn't come in. <laughs> oh, well. I, I have to say, though, this is the first time in the series, this particular volume, uh, where I feel like the history's not, not playing out the way I'd expect it to. And in some cases, like at Hastings, it felt really wrong. <laughs> I mean, that's a battle I know enough about, we know enough about, to say it didn't work that, like, the Normans could just outflank um, the, uh, the position that the Saxons had taken and just crush it that way. And that's essentially what happened. But then the shield wall kind of dissolved when hit front on as well. And these others... It just is feeling like the choice of the, the, you know, if these were all zero counters, they wouldn't be breaking that easily. You'd have a push going on at the front. Um, but instead, you're just making it way too easy for a couple of, you know, a little bit of luck in favor of the attacker just swings things so completely. The attacker's got the edge to begin with just because those spearmen are so crappy. And um, I'm not sure that there's anything wrong with the fundamentals of the system. Like I said, you know, look, it's a beer and pretzels game, but it's tended to give okay, believable results in a lot of them. Now, Men of Iron had some where, uh, I, I, I remember at least one scenario in Men of Iron. Uh, what was it? Edward against the Scots. Um, where, uh, things went not the way they should have very badly. And it, it was hard to picture how they could have gone well. So even in that original one, I feel like there were flaws, but here I feel like there's something that's just sort of pervading this whole volume, um, that I'm finding very, uh, very hard to believe, to tell you the truth. Uh, some of the others, it felt like eh, maybe some special rules needed to be modified and tweaked, and maybe they are in the tri pack. I don't know, but this one is is feeling like it's a pity because I felt like Arquebus and uh, um, Blood and Roses had gotten away from the heart of the game which is medieval, which felt like it's kind of relatively early medieval combat, not the late medieval that those two, two, uh, two, two volumes covered. Um, you know, where they're throwing gunpowder and artillery in and all kind of crap like that. And it's just like, 
<laughs> you're getting too close to musket and pike for me <laughs> by that point. Um, but here, it just doesn't feel like it's holding up in the same way. And, and some of it is, you know, some of those earl other men of, uh, of iron scenarios and the infidel scenarios, eh, you know, you could look at them and you, and you would say, yeah, I could see it going either way, or maybe the edge is not quite where you wanted it. There was at least one battle where it felt like, yeah, it's just out, out of the question. Now, I think one of the things that they did was with the shield walls, they wanted to prevent, because I think the Shiltron was just like, or Skiltron, I don't know, was just too potent, and they wanted to water it down, but I, I feel like they went way too far somehow. And it may just be that, like, you know, that may just be a point of modifier. I should look at that. 